question, uh, I will talk about who we are or uh, what we have done before. Uh, then I will uh, speak a little about a uh, short project history, I mean this AI project history. Uh, then I will speak about how our uh, research team works. Then I will speak about what is actually uh, general artificial intelligence and why, why we think it's uh, so important. And uh, then I will go to our long-term plans, uh, short-term plans, where uh, there will be two parts. One will be short-term plans uh, focused on uh, research and development, and the other part will be uh, short-term plans focused on commercialization or some commercial application of what we do. And uh, at the end, uh, I will uh, discuss some open problems, and then uh, the presentation will switch to Dushan and Martin, uh, who will continue in more technical uh, stuff. So uh, my part, my first part will be, uh, should be really uh, easy to understand uh, for normal people. That's basically called the uh, presentation. So about, about us or about me, in this case, uh, I, uh, I had interest in uh, AI and robotics since uh, I was 15 years old. And back then, I, uh, I actually didn't know how to start this project or what to do. And, uh, but I kind of felt that uh, uh, I need to start my own company and basically do the research under my own uh, company and not just some academia or uh, things like that. And it's probably mostly because I'm the type of person who wants to have things under control and who also wants to start things. So uh, later, many, many years later, uh, actually I, I would like to like point out one thing that Pavel, uh, actually I started as a programmer when I was 15, I started programming and basically I was until 30 something. And uh, during that path, actually, I started Kids Software House. And then after some time, I uh, stopped being a programmer and I went just, just you know, like the, the boss. Or something. <laughs> so but I started as a programmer, you know. And, uh, and so, uh, how to achieve this, uh, or how uh, to uh, get a chance to achieve uh, general artificial intelligence research. I was thinking that, okay, my second interest was uh, virtual reality and games. And so I decided that uh, uh, it's a thing I like, so let's make some game, make money, and then invest the money to uh, AI research. And so after many, many tries and you know, things like that, uh, we actually built a first successful game, which was Space Engineers. Um, and uh, it started to sell, uh, to sell very well. So we were able to invest the money in a, this AI project. And uh, just a couple of, couple of months ago, we also started the second engineering game, Medieval Engineers, which also s sells very well. So we are able to also invest this money, or what we can invest in AI research. Not everything, but you know, some important part. So that was my plan, basically, make money on games, invest it in uh, AI, and uh, the next step was to set up an AI uh, research team uh, uh, with people who will share the same goal as I, I have with AI, and uh, that's basically what we are doing uh, last, last year. And because we are uh, lucky with the uh, games, uh, the development funds for the AI project we have right now is over $10 million, so we really can focus on the long-term plans and we are not uh, pushed by uh, short-term goals like uh, really some application in a year or two years. We really can do things for 10 years and uh, we are allowed to do this. So the project started in January 2014, that's uh, more than a year ago. Uh, at the beginning uh, it was just uh, Martin, first, first member, and then some other people started to join as uh, we realized that we can actually let the biggest funds to hire more people, that we are not limited. And uh, at the beginning we were considering various um, uh, approaches to AI from really uh, biologically based, like spiking neural networks and uh, another, to uh, approaches that are really artificial or like mathematical. And uh, at the current stage of the project uh, we are more inclined to the artificial uh, methods, but we are still uh, inspired by biology and mostly by behavioral psychology and things like that. Uh, along the, the, the path for the last year, we made a tool, uh, it's called Brain Simulator, and it's an application or an environment where we test our hypotheses and uh, where we develop our models or recoding brains. And uh, Dushan, he will speak uh, in detail about this. And one of the 
biggest milestones we achieved in last uh, in this year was uh, an AI brain that's able to uh, play a pop game. It's a similar thing as uh, Google DeepMind achieved. And uh, again, Pusha will explain more details. And uh, we don't consider this to be some huge breakthrough. It was just one of the milestones we wanted to achieve. And uh, now we are focusing on next milestone and next milestone. And during the last year, the team grown to 12 people, I think. and. Uh, uh, it's still growing. Actually, uh, there was a moment where we said, like, uh, okay, let's stop at 10 people, and, uh, and let's see. But after a few few months or few weeks, uh, we decided to just continue hire more people because the, we had the funds and the project and uh, and uh, like the possible potential of this project seems so important that there is no reason to like save money or not to do it. Now we'll speak about how our team works, how we do the uh, development or how we do the research. We have like uh, two periods. We go from uh, very specific milestones to uh, to uh, periods or two times where uh, there is a free research where people can do almost whatever they want or what they decide. And so we are switching these two phases. There is this free phase and there is milestone phase. And uh, each one is usually one or two months long. And uh, the milestone is good because uh, milestone usually sets uh, some uh, some goal that we can test and we can say like okay we achieved the goal uh, the milestone because these and these goals are accomplished. And uh, whereas the, there is this uh, free uh, research thing where people can go more freely and basically do uh, what they want. And then later in the milestone phase, we actually converge back to some very specific uh, point. Uh, uh, we have uh, two uh, meetings, like team meetings, uh, each week. It's usually uh, not usually every uh, Tuesday and Thursday. And one is uh, brainstorming, where uh, everybody can speak up and just say anything he wants. Uh, for example, something he read somewhere or some new discovery he made or just ask other people. And uh, then there is the other uh, meeting, we call it update meeting, and on these meetings uh, everyone uh, stands up and uh, says uh, what he achieved since the last meeting and uh, what is he going to do. And this is good because it allows us to share the knowledge and also it allows other people to know what other people are working on. So this is how we do uh, meetings. Uh, we also try to replicate uh, like project management ideas or methodologies we use in the game team because it works there and uh, this fast uh, development, uh, rapid iteration, all these things really work well for games. So there is a good chance uh, they should work for uh, AI research as well. Except there is one uh, difference of course that AI research is more, um, like the goals are not so sometimes not so easily attainable and uh, and also the results are not so cool as you know in the games but we uh, anyway we try to replicate the, the way we do the game development and for this uh, we, what we do is basically uh, we uh, give uh, ourselves a goal then try to get to the goal as fast as possible to see if it was a good idea or a bad idea and uh, then we have a fast feedback, we know if it was a good idea or a bad idea, and in case it was a good idea, we continue, if it was a bad idea, we kill it and just start some other thing. So, uh, like in industry, this is called like rapid, uh, rapid iteration, and it allows basically quickly finding good ways and, uh, and leaving the, the bad ways. And uh, what's next? Uh, where is the, I will speak about this uh, more uh, later, but. Uh, uh, what we want to do is move our project from stealth mode, where it was until now, where we didn't speak much about the project, to a more open uh, project where we will uh, be explaining what we found out, what's our progress, what we are going to do, and we also are going to allow third-party developers to kind of join our team and uh, help with the development. And uh, the reason for it is that uh, it's also an inspiration for the game development, where we found that if we get fast feedback from customers and players, it uh, creates kind of pressure on the team to actually deliver fast results and uh, not spend time on some just some academic ideas or things like that. And uh, uh, and uh, also we we hope that we will get ideas from the community of other developers and researchers or even people who are not experts on AI, but maybe they will have some 
some uh, interesting insight. And uh, so now the interesting part: uh, why are we developing artificial intelligence? Uh, this part may seem crazy for some of you, and uh, but it's probably the, the most interesting part uh, to understand why we are developing uh, general AI. So I will start first with explaining the difference between narrow and general AI. Narrow AI is an artificial intelligence algorithm that's focusing on just some specific problem and cannot be applied to different problem or maybe after some heavy changes. Uh, on the contrary, general AI is AI that can adapt to any type of problem and then move on another problem, another problem, just like people. Uh, so that's why we want to uh, develop general AI. We are not really focusing on a specific narrow AI algorithms. Or if we are, then only as a part of the architecture. Uh, general, in our opinion, general uh, AI is the, from the investment point of view, and I'm not speaking only about money, but also about, uh, from the point of view of our effort, our time, uh, it has the highest uh, return on investment possible. If we imagine some money spent on AI today, and if you consider that the AI in future will self, uh, self evolve or self develop, self replicate, uh, the, the growth will be exponential and uh, it will just be, in my opinion, brutal. So, I mean, the, the growth will be brutal, not the AI. <laughs> and uh, the, so, when we consider this, uh, the market for AI or the things where uh, people can benefit from general AI can be practically unlimited because. We don't think it will just end on Earth. I think, uh, I, I mean, we think it will continue to, to the universe. So, uh, market size from like investor point of view is unlimited. It also could be our final invention, and I don't mean this in a wrong way. Like uh, we will make AI and then we are done. Uh, I mean it in a way that uh, uh, we create AI, and from that moment AI will keep going and inventing its own thing. Uh, in, in a direction that we consider to be useful for us. That's the idea that let AI invent all the millions of other things that there are to, to be invented. Uh, we'll, uh, how we see it is that in the future there can be AI scientists, programmers, engineers, basically AI anything. And uh, we are assuming that the AI will do the job better than people. And. Uh, and that everybody will uh, benefit from AI future and uh, the, uh, the AI will change the world in uh, 10 to 50 years, so we will see. So uh, our long term goals is uh, to develop a human level uh, artificial intelligence and by this I mean uh, AI that has the same uh, mental or cognitive capabilities as uh, people. So uh, it should be able to learn uh, and adapt to an environment while uh, seeking what's most beneficial for the AI or maximizing its uh, reward function. And uh, uh, the principle of our project is basically that we are trying to build a brain where on one side there is input from sensors, it can be vision, auditory sensors, whatever. Uh, then there is input uh, signal which is reward and punishment so the AI actually knows if it is doing, good, uh, if it is doing a good thing or bad thing. And on the output, there is uh, some muscle, uh, for example, muscle commands or some motor commands or anything like this. And what's in the middle, that's the brain. And uh, we are trying to build a universal brain that's capable of finding patterns in input signals, also output signals, and in the signals that are happening in the middle or inside the brain, and uh, is able to find associations, correlations, causalities in these uh, signals and then act uh, in a way that's maximizing the, the reward. Uh, this, is, this is the principle of what we are trying to do. So if, in our opinion, it doesn't matter if uh, the AI will be used on a robot, like a hardware robot, or a car, or a, a virtual simulation a robot, or a game, or even some database application, uh, because the brain will be able to learn uh, the patterns, uh, all the patterns that are coming in, coming out, coming inside and then do what's best for, for the reward function. And uh, uh, about the reward, uh, this is the interesting thing that uh, we as creators can say what's the reward. If you say, if it was people, then the uh, reward would be uh, survival. Uh, in the case of robots,
robot, we don't uh, need a robot to survive, so we can sell, uh, we can sell lots of rewards. So it can be, if he's a cleaning robot, his reward can be like a good, you know, good cleaning or or maybe uh, his owner saying like, okay, you did a good job. That can be his reward and he doesn't need to have a much more like higher reward. So we don't need to be worried about AI taking over the world or something like this. Uh, if the reward system will be correctly set. And uh, one thing that uh, we also keep in mind is the is learning. Uh, we don't want to make AI that's pre-programmed in some way, and uh, this means that AI should be able to uh, on, uh, learn online uh, while the signals are coming in, coming out. Uh, there is not like a phase for training or offline learning or something like this. It's like with people, people are receiving signals, they're processing it, it's coming coming out and then again and again and again. It's like a one loop that's just going forever. So also our AI should uh, be able to process all this data online. Uh, and uh, the way uh, AI will learn uh, what to do is basically by interacting with the environment, just like uh, uh, people do when uh, a human is born, uh, it has except some uh, inborn uh, architecture, it has no knowledge about the world, doesn't know what to do, and basically the baby will start learning one thing after another thing by interacting with the environment, with itself, with other people, and uh, it will create a hierarchy of patterns of what's good or what to do in, in each situation, and so on. Uh, our short-term goals, uh, as I mentioned, uh, one uh, short-term goal which we achieved was uh, an AI that's able to play pong. Uh, we made it uh, in a similar way as, uh, as uh, DeepMind. This means that the AI sees just the raw pixels on screen or on a pong emulator. Uh, the, the AI brain doesn't have uh, structured information about the world of the book. It just uh, has this unstructured uh, raw pixels. And uh, AI needs to, uh, uh, the image signal needs to go through some uh, series of pre-processing. And basically the AI needs to find some uh, patterns in what it sees. Then it needs to find patterns in uh, when it's getting reward and punishment. In our case, it's when the ball drops. Uh, that's punishment and when the ball um, uh, kicks up, uh, that's a uh, reward. And uh, the goal of AI is to understand the patterns where it's getting reward and then try to uh, replicate those situations or what it did in those situations and uh, at the same time avoid situation where it's getting uh, punishment. That's the principle. And also, uh, in our case, uh, it, uh, it wasn't born with any uh, pre-programmed information. It just has to learn this from unstructured data. Uh, upcoming milestones that we are going to approach in a month and something is, a, is an AI that's able to play much more complex game than Pong, because in fact Pong, Pong is actually quite a simple environment and uh, you don't need intelligence to play Pong. So, uh, that's not good testing environment for us, and uh, we we, are, we create a little uh, game which has little uh, more complex environment and little more complex game rules, and uh, this uh, uh, our AI will need to again uh, find situation or act in situation uh, in a way that it gets reward and avoid situation where it's getting punishment. And this new game will be a little bit more complex because it will it will have something we call delayed reward, and this means that. It needs to do something, then something, then something, and then it gets reward. And the AI needs to understand the entire pattern, uh, the entire sequence, and to know that uh, it got uh, uh, the reward because first it did this, then this, then this, and so on. And then it can generalize this information on this pattern and try it again in a different situation, maybe a little bit different way. And uh, then the next uh, much more advanced uh, milestone will be uh, AI that's able to play multiple games. Not at the same time, but the idea is that uh, uh, we will uh, let the AI play, play one game, it will learn to play the game, then we will uh, let it play another game, it will learn the game, then we will collectively get 
again to the first game and it will be able to play that game without forgetting the information or forgetting the knowledge how to play the game. And uh, along with all these uh, this, this things, uh, we are working on something which I can describe like muscle control, which is um, uh, part of our modular architecture where uh, uh, where uh, instead of controlling a, a pedal in pong by just moving left, right, left, right, we are trying to control a body where you have multiple muscles and you need to control them in a sequence. Uh, it's like playing on a piano or something like this and you need to basically send the signals in the correct sequence so you will actually uh, execute useful uh, behavior. For example, like balancing, it's never just one command but it's a multitude of commands and they need to be kind of played in a, in a sequence. And now about the commercial, uh, commercial short-term goals, uh, I said that we have this like, long-term vision, 10 years or even more, but uh, we also uh, want to do something that will be uh, useful for other people uh, while we are developing our long-term goal. And for this we decided that uh, during this year, I think we will be in the middle of year, we will uh, open the brand simulator, this uh, environment we are using to other people, probably like, for free. Uh, we will also open a, a marketplace where other developers will be able to develop their own AI modules, upload it to this marketplace, of course other people will be able to download, uh, people will be able to uh, upload uh, projects, these brands, and uh, other people will be able to download them. And uh, uh, so basically we are trying to create a platform or ecosystem where not just us, but other people will be exchanging their ideas and modules for AI. And uh, hopefully uh, uh, it will grow and uh, it will also help us to get, uh, to get uh, further in the project. And uh, basically this is the part where we are seeking the pressure from the external world because uh, we believe that uh, if uh, our project is visible to other people, we will actually work, uh, work much harder and we will be more focused on some useful uh, results of the, of the research and not just playing with some ideas. And uh, there can be uh, the commercial uh, idea or uh, results. Uh, one thing is that uh, at the beginning there won't be many because the AI has this has this disadvantage that it's actually uh, it needs to be useful to for some people to, to use it. If uh, you have an AI that's just able to play pong, you are not going to hire it to drive your car, you know, or uh, do some job. You actually need to cross certain threshold, and uh, uh, until then the AI is not not useful. So also in this case, we think uh, that at the beginning it will go very slow, and there will be Basically, it will be just a place for hobbyists to exchange these modules and, uh, and push us, but uh, uh, not, not many uh, companies will actually use the, the ecosystem. And this will change in the moment when there will be actually useful modules that can do something that's useful for people. And uh, our business model for this could be uh, licensing the, these brands to companies that are building either uh, robots or either uh, software application that can use some AI in them. And th that's the idea, basically. Uh, we are also considering uh, equity crowdfunding. Uh, not only, not that we need it that much, but uh, the reason is, there are basically two reasons. First is that allow people to invest in AI, and uh, I will explain later why we think it's, uh, it's good for people and beneficial. And also, uh, a critical funding can serve as like public relation kind of thing for the project because people who like the idea of AI and who understand its long-term benefits, if they invest in AI, they will be actually some kind of like uh, messengers or they will be spreading the idea of the company. And then just a quick explanation is a critical funding. It's basically a way uh, where people can buy little shares, little pieces of the company by investing in the company. And uh, together with these commercial short-term goals, uh, we will continue in uh, basic uh, research and development. We are working on, uh, uh, on working on right now, but we don't want to like, uh, 
bit about um, any problems on the uh, R&D part. So this will continue, but uh, if there will be some uh, early commercial application on our platform, we'll actually try to integrate it in our R&D project and the way it's going. Uh, and now to open problems. Um, recently there, there has been a lot of talk about dangers of AI and stuff like that. And uh, uh, we are also like, reading these uh, articles, books and thinking about it. And our take on this is that, uh, of course, it can be dangerous, but uh, uh, there are multiple reasons why I think that uh, if the AI will have safe uh, reward system, and if the reward will not be kill all people, but actually be useful to people, for example, and also if the AI will be advanced enough to understand that collaboration is better than competition, uh, then it will not present a danger to us. That's basically our idea about AI safety. And there is actually, um, our there are more important things than uh, killer robots, and that's the impact of AI and robots on job market in the next 10 or 20 years. And uh, as uh, you probably noticed, uh, there are many jobs that are um, being replaced by automation, not just robots, but uh, software or anything that can be automated. And uh, people uh, in these jobs, they are losing those jobs and uh, uh, they don't have uh, a value for job market that they can offer, so basically they stay unemployed. And do you think this can be a bigger uh, danger for, for people? Uh, if we imagine that 50% of people or 80% of people don't have a job because nobody uh, needs them to do any job because can hire a robot or some uh, AI software, uh, then that's a bigger problem for those people. So uh, our approach to this, our solution to this, is actually start investing uh, either people or governments or you know who wants start investing in AI companies now when it's actually quite cheap. And uh, basically, uh, in future, we have some kind of pension or dividends from AI companies. That's what we are actually doing here, uh, except that we are doing the R&D. And, and uh, then there is this problem with narrow AI, uh, as I described. And uh, the thing is that uh, we will. Uh, this this uh, applies also to our project. And. Uh, we understand that we will need to uh, wait until the threshold is met to have AI that's actually useful. It's like, uh, for example, you probably know about uh, Google self-driving cars, and uh, it sounds cool, but if it's not working 100%, and if there are still some situation where it won't work, then people will not use the technology. So uh, I hope it will work, because I want uh, such a car, but uh, it really needs to work, and uh, this applies to everything in AI, that you need to meet the threshold to get through them. And uh, one open problem that uh, we were considering at the beginning of the project right now, it's not a big issue for us, but it was the idea that if we will be actually able, if we ever will be able to simulate intelligence that's on the level of human uh, brain, because if you just do a pure calculation, like 100 billion neurons, uh, if you try to simulate in a computer, it will require extreme amount of memory and everything like this. So our kind of um, idea about this is that we hope that uh, our alg algorithms will be a little bit more optimized than how nature did its job. And this is one, one solution. And the other is that Moore's law is uh, working in our um, in our benefit, and uh, since we started the project now, quite soon, in 10 years or 15 years, the co computers will be much faster and advanced, so maybe we'll just meet them at the right time. And uh, so what can you do for yourself if you want to benefit from AI? Uh, you can invest in AI companies, and, uh, or you can consider if you are uh, AI researcher, programmer, or PR guy, uh, you can join our team. Uh, we are still looking for uh, AI researchers and programmers, basically the guys that we have right now in the team who are doing the basic uh, R&D. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we decided to actually start hiring some uh, software architects and engineers who will work on, not on the research, but who will work on the infrastructure for the brain simulator and for this platform marketplace I mentioned. So the position is open and also uh, we are looking for a PR guy who will help us spread the word about what we are doing and it's an ongoing plan. And uh, 
website or company for this uh, project. It's a, right now it's under uh, his software house, but uh, during this year we will spin it off to a uh, separate company. And uh, I don't want to reveal the name of the company yet, so we don't have a website where you can follow what we are doing. So right now just please follow my blog and uh, his software house website and uh, when there will be right time, we will announce this new company and then you can start following it. So thank you, and now to show Okay, so uh, again, good evening. Uh, my name is Dushan Ferocha, and I would like to give you a little more technical insight into our project. So, uh, as Marek said, uh, we are developing an artificial artificial general intelligence and we understand it like well, right now it may change in the future but uh, we understand it as an autonomous agent which is able to perceive and change its environment uh, able to remember reason plan and it's adaptable can learn from its environment can remember such a knowledge and uh, Finally, it is able to communicate. So uh, this is our goal, and uh, we have to decide uh, what we're going to use for s fulfilling such a goal. And there are many ways how these things can be done, and most of these are quite sophisticated, mm -hmm. like classical AI architectures, some inference machine expert system, you probably heard some of them. And um, actually, there are some cognitive architecture definitions already. Of course, there are artificial neural networks, quite famous for some very interesting tasks they can do. And uh, maybe even multi-agent systems with their social abilities and stuff. And we'll probably need all of them. So there's another problem. How we we only use them together, how we connect them and uh, incorporate it into a bigger system. And uh, we need a tool for that. And of course, we also want to implement our own modules to the system and we want to connect them and, co and make them cooperate. So we need something we can develop in and uh, we need also something we, where we can see the whole model and we are, at this point, uh, believe that uh, the rich interface, the graphical view of the system, and uh, the visualization uh, abilities of such a tool will be quite crucial. And also, you want to, or we want to uh, control the simulation with appropriate tools and run it on different architectures with. Uh, using of various hardware and uh, the other things like parallel execution should be possible with such a tool. And we're thinking what we are going to use for that and well, unfortunately there are some flaws with all existing system we find and we decided to build something which will be able to connect already existing frameworks and libraries into one and we inspired from things like uh, Maya Material Editor, if you, if you know, or with the simulating or even this robot operation system um, software. And also we want to incorporate existing libraries like Kafka or DeepNets and others. So our solution is the Brain Simulator application, as Marek already said. And uh, the main idea is that you have modules which can be connected through data connections, which is not really a, good, a new idea, but we think it's a good idea. And inside these modules, we call them nodes, there are tasks. These tasks can handle the parts of memory blocks, and these memory blocks uh, holds the data of the model, and the overall brain is connected to the environment, to the world, where the world can pass data into the model, uh, to the brain, 
and then some controls can be applied to a body which actually lives in the world. And also there is a view for such a model and there are observers for model data. So there is a set of standard methods how data can be viewed. And during the execution, the researcher can change model parameters through graphical UI. Also, there is uh, some adjustable servers. Even you can write your, your own servers. You can, of, of course, write your own nodes. And you can control the whole simulation with that. Right now, the brain simulator uses uh, CUDA technology as a parallel implementation. We are uh, implementing also Intel V support, and it is possible to run your models on multiple GPUs if you have like multiple GPUs installed in your machine. Um, this is a green screenshot of the main window of the brain simulator, and you can see that there are some nodes connected, some standard observer open probably on the visual input to the brain, and there are some other dialogues around where you can change, for example, parameters during runtime and some <laughs> other, other things. Okay, so during development of this system and during uh, research on this project, we already implemented a set of different modules, uh, and there are some of them, as you can see, they are uh, standard feed for your nets and some recurrent nets, also some self-organization models like famous Kohonen map or uh, growing neural gas, which is very useful, for example, for long-term memories. And also we are interested in vector assembly architecture and all uh, say something more about that later. And we imported some existing modules like CAFE, which is the um, framework for deep learning and stuff like this. Um, There's just a short example of how uh, easy it is to use brain simulator. This node here is the Kohonen map and it's run on a NIST dataset, which you might know. It's the quite a big database of handwritten digits, and usually researchers are competing each other to get a better classificator about that set. So you can, you can build such kind of experiment like in five minutes, <coughs> and later maybe you can, we can play a little bit with the simulator. Okay, so uh, that was about uh, the tool. So right now we have a goal we want to achieve. We have a tool. And uh, I would like to talk a little more about how we're going to achieve this goal with this tool. So my colleague mentioned that uh, we are betting on iterative approach, quite uh, similar to a extreme programming from our side. And it relies on early implementation and experimenting with models. So uh, whenever you can, you build an experiment, maybe you read a paper, get an idea, but still you should be able to make an experiment as soon as possible. Then we separate <coughs> the ideas into team members and try to do some separate experiments, like proof of concepts, with uh, different stuff like data representation, memory models, learning strategy, things like that. And, uh, and when the milestone comes, as Marek already said, all these models will um, be merged together into something functional. So uh, we are usually using these separate experiment with some like mocked up parts where you can extract some information from the world itself. Like we can ignore computer vision, for example, and just take some 
data from the world and test uh, some symbolic architecture or whatever. Yeah. And uh, the whole model then is incorporated into milestone and I would like to give you some details about one or two milestones we already achieved. So the first milestone as a test of uh, integration of uh, these parts and test of methodology was the six leg robot milestone which is uh, actually connected to the space engineers game and uh, there's a runtime visual data processing and after that the data is somehow handled inside very easily and turned into the body control which is then sent back to the space engineers game where the robot is uh, implemented and it controls the body. The whole system is totally supervised and there are some like hard wide movements the robot learns from the mentor how to move its, uh, its body and there is a very simple vision to action association so actually the robot will learn from what he's seeing how to act so to just uh, okay I'm seeing something and the mentor is uh, moving my body to the left side so I'll remember that so that was the first experiment uh, just give you a little view So as you can see, there is a view to the Space Engineers game and on the upper part here there are uh, controls to the different joints of the robot and uh, well, basically that's it. So on this one, we uh, tested that we are able to incorporate all the parts together, and we move on. The next uh, milestone was the home or breakout game, and this one gets very really interesting because it's really from the bitmap to buttons. There's no other information for the brain than the bitmap and the reward or punishment signals. And this is turned over time into actions. And there are some parts of it, but there are some interesting parts of the brain. And uh, I will talk a little more about the insights. Okay, so this is the global model which plays Pong and you can see that there's a visual input and the image processing module, visual working memory module and here bitmap is passed, bitmap <coughs> is turned into segments or super pixels or the candidates for objects you want to track and uh, inside the visual memory this information is turned into symbols um, symbols can be viewed as a distributed representation of the data you, uh, the, the robot actually is seeing or the agent is seeing and uh, these symbols are then passed into higher reasoning part of the brain where the goal memory is formed uh, which is conditioned with the reward or punishment signal and the action learning module where appropriate actions are learned according to the fitness which is passed from the goal memory. Um, well, this is a little insight into the image processing part. It's not uh, something really new, I think. Uh, it's uh, for demonstrative purposes, it's on a different game. But you can see that there's an input image which is uh, segmented into these super pixels and the super pixels are weight somehow so if uh, like these two super pixels are the part of the same um, object or not and uh, then this 
graph is uh, reduced into the object representation, and you can see that there are objects identified, and these objects can be then tracked and used by the brain. Okay, so now a little more about uh, goal memory. So you can see that uh, this part is here, and the goal memory itself contains two parts. And according to the reward signal, or punishment signal, the, uh, the agent will remember the state of the working memory he wants to achieve. Or, on the other hand, it will remember the goal state. It's not the goal state, it's some state it wants to avoid. And from such information, a fitness value is created and the fitness value is uh, passed into the action learning mechanism, which effectively learns action from the past. So the bot will, or the agent, will perform an action, and from this action, the fitness value is created if actually the bot is closer to the goal or it is harder from the goal. And uh, if it is closer, the fitness value becomes positive, this map becomes active, and the training pattern is created for the map. So it is something like, okay, this moves me, moved me closer to my goal state, I want to learn that. I want to learn that action in this particular state. So in the future, I will repeat that more. And now we can watch uh, the result. what's interesting in a scene. So, uh, there are some strategies how the brain will find out that something is interesting and one of the part of the strategy is, for example, movement. So, things that move are usually interesting. And here, you can see the output of the action learning system. This one is the action which is actually taken this is uh, the left, stay where I live, where you are, and this is go to the right. And this is the kind of similarity measure between the positive goal and the negative goal state and the actual content of the working memory. And the green one, which is not sure if you see here, but okay. The green one is the similarity between the current state and the goal, positive goal state, and the red one is the similarity between the negative goal state. And it means that uh, if the brain is uh, learned correctly, then the green line should be above the red line. The similarity between the goal, the positive goal state, should be bigger. Okay, so. Oh, it's not a surprise, it plays ball. And you can see how, how the attention will constantly change in the attention between the ball, the pedal, and the rest of the scene. Of course, it's not perfect. The quality of learning is around 90%. Ok, 
Okay, so what will be next? The next milestone we already decided is a two dimensional egocentric game where the agent will be placed in the two dimensional world. Uh, it will perceive the nearest proximity of uh, itself, and there will be a navigation and even spatial representation of the environment which is necessary to take some interesting action. And we want to implement um, variable extraction and about that, uh, or this variable extraction should be probably um, done by something like the of you learning algorithm, where multiple goals and motivation can be you know, formed and a kind of goal chain chaining should be possible. And, and when I'm talking about goal chaining, I mean something, okay, if I want to get a reward, I need to open the door, then open another door, don't fall into the pit, and then I will get my reward. So something which is not really possible with a system like this, because in this system you can always or you must be able always to measure how close you're in to the goal state. And of course, if uh, there is a door in a way, and it is not possible to really measure every taken action, because if you open the door, the similarity to the goal state will change enormously. And, uh, so that would be the next milestone and some future milestones, as Marek already said, should be playing the same, with the same model, playing different games. So we will learn one game and then we will test that we are able to learn different games with the same model. The next milestone should be playing the different games with the same model instance. So one model trained on one game will be then retrain into another game, but with the condition that uh, does, it must not forget playing the first one. <coughs> so there must be a kind of a context detection mechanism inside such a model. And also as a, let's say, side project, there is a project of uh, motoric systems, which is right now uh, not very connected to these milestones, as you can see, but uh, we will need them, uh, I think, very soon. We will need to be able to control some complex body, like bipedal robot or something like this. So we should be able to learn the system to manipulate with uh, uh, its complex body to perform some sequences of movements in order to use manipulators or even balance and stuff like that. And also during the way or we should be able to uh, extend and we need to go further with our platform, with our framework and uh, we want to release the brain simulator to, co to the community, so I hope you'll be able to use our tool you know, for your experiments, and I would be very happy to see such a situation. And uh, also we want uh, HPC solution to be implemented inside our tool, uh, so even very big models can be simulated inside uh, the tool, and controlled and uh, effectively <coughs> experimenting with. And also, in the next phase, we are retargeting Unix system releases because we are aware that not all of you are happy to use uh, C Sharp and, and uh, Microsoft Windows. <coughs> Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, now the question session will begin.
but uh, it's open for your questions. Uh, well, uh, you can ask whatever you want, either technical or more philosophical questions. It's open for you because we are really interested in your feedback, what you think about our project, and do you have some suggestions. Uh, because we are here quite in a big amount, we need to somehow use microphones, so when you are, if you are in, in somewhere, uh, in, if you are in, uh, uh, just ask for a microphone and we will handle it for you. So it is now open for uh, your questions. And we will try to answer if uh, I don't know the answer, some of my colleagues will answer. And you can also ask in check. tries to do some approximations on that, but this is going a little opposite to the way how, for example, human brains operate, because it is known from several studies that an attention model is inside the brain, and this uh, attention model is implemented in your visual brain, so it's not just a matter of your eyes moving the retina in the position when Retina has um, at most uh, cells it is possible, but also the attention, for example, for the size of the object you are perceiving can be changed inside your brain. And we try to implement that, and we find that there are some positive uh, attributes for that. For example, you can uh, find different shapes inside different shapes or inside various shapes and when you're like identifying an object for example a bicycle then you can tell that the bicycle is a uh, part of two circular things and then something edgy inside yeah and in this way you can build a hierarchical representation of the um, symbol you're perceiving which is more flexible than uh, just focusing on the whole range. Thank you. I would like to ask you, uh, do you think your AI will be able to um, grasp the, the concept of games like chess or Go? As these are like the uh, holy grail of AI. Like, I saw like the bomb and stuff, so I was like wondering, you said like, do you have a model for this like sequence reward? But when there, there's like more complicated rules, like let's say chess. Yeah, I think we are not focused on this uh, area, which is more related to game theory, which is uh, we have one expert in game theory, and we will probably incorporate some modules for it. But the main aim of our general and the artificial intelligence is not uh, that we uh, give it rules of chess or go and to then uh, to make it in a way how the algorithms for chess playing can be play card and which is usually like mm -hmm. making big databases and uh, extensive search through so all possible movements and stuff like this. We are more interested in the interaction with the environment. Maybe in some later future as a side product can be that it can understand playing chess, but it's not our um, I, think I will just add to this that uh, in future, when our AI will be much more advanced, uh, we think it will be actually possible to have it learn 
play chess or any other game just by interacting with the game board, you know, and from that extracting the rules and, uh, and that's it, you know, that's the point. But right now uh, the, game, uh, the AI is able to play board. Uh, I don't believe it will be able to play chess in each, uh, its uh, current form. But uh, in a few years, after we get uh, these uh, modules uh, in, in an advanced uh, form, uh, they will be able to have some uh, working memory, long-term memory, some meta predictions, maybe working with some like um, symbols, I mean like people use symbols in language and stuff like that, then uh, it, it should be quite easy to play chess. And uh, the idea is that it's a general artificial intelligence, so we uh, don't uh, we kind of don't care uh, where it will be used. You know, it can be used on chess or some other game. It's really not important because the general AI will be able to learn the rules and to just act in a way that's maximizing the reward. I was wondering, how are you going to handle the evolution of, uh, of the brain core as, uh, as the functionality grows, both uh, non-functional properties and functional properties? <laughs> Uh, we can. Uh, we are not mainly, mostly using evolution algorithms, most properties, but we can. Uh, we can. Uh, the architecture is ready for uh, evolution algorithms, but we don't use them at the moment because they are uh, quite heavy for resources. Because you need to make many. Uh, parallel executions of the same model and then do the combination and stuff like this. So uh, it's usually not useful for like rapid prototyping because you need a long time before you get some uh, reasonable uh, result evolution. So uh, at the moment we do not have there something like uh, auto adaptation or something like a configuration of the inner part of the module, but uh, uh, the system is prepared to, that we can implement it to that. So it's not uh, the part of the system now. Maybe I will just uh, add to this that uh, usually you want to use evolutional algorithms when you have a system, have a set of parameters, and you want to have them the best set that you, that you can. But right now, we are more focused on the architecture part, which is much trickier with the evolution to create a good architecture. And so maybe that's why we are a little postponing to this into the phase when we actually will be in need to do this. Uh, I will uh, the way uh, we set the milestone is uh, kind of like copying uh, how the evolution uh, evolved intelligence, uh, not like 100% uh, copying, but uh, you're basically adding layer after layer of uh, intelligence uh, functionality. But we are doing it in an engineering uh, way, uh, so we don't really, we want to understand uh, why our models work and uh, uh, we want to, uh, so when we develop some uh, architecture, for example, like for, for home, we actually want to know like, like okay, this part is doing visual processing, this part is doing pres uh, predictions of working memory, this part is controlling some uh, muscles or something like that. And uh, we don't want to have just like a set of, like huge set of magic numbers. They're doing what we want, but we don't really know what they are doing. So we are really want a modular architecture.
load balancing so if we find out or the system finds out that some part is really heavily used so it will be enforced and uh, there will be more resources attached to, to this part so uh, uh, we in long term really want a uh, system which is able to rebel itself it's not like uh, that we only uh, make the graph and the graph keeps fixed
One is um, you have the example with the, with the Pong uh, game. And uh, well, what it seems to me is uh, that uh, the way how we have uh, made your solution is very um, overfitting on the game. Uh, by that I mean, uh, can you take uh, the code, the design that you have made, and uh, put it into another game and let it run without any um, any specific uh, large changes of configuration, if you know what I mean. Yes, this is uh, our next milestone, as Dushan said, that we will use uh, or we will try to find the way how to use it for uh, different games. Uh, you are right that uh, the model is overfitting for uh, for Pong, but our goal is not to play the Pong in the best way how it can be played, but we are also testing some ideas uh, on this particular sort of simple problem. So we have the uh, experiments on how to represent the space, uh, to, to test our visual system, to test the uh, working memory and stuff like this. So, uh, this is the reason why the model is maybe too complex for playing POM, but as I said, uh, we don't want to play POM, so this is like just sort of exercise uh, on which we can uh, simply test our modules as well. So. Um, another thing is that uh, a lot of these um, solutions or artificial intelligence uh, systems are basically um, designed on human level intelligence. And uh, one thing that humans are really famous for are their, is their stupidity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how, uh, how, how do you want to assure that uh, this kind of design, this kind of law in the design will not enter the product? <laughs> just, just a short answer, we'll be very happy to create some AI that will be as stupid as we Thank you. Uh, if I will uh, maybe say something more about how we actually plan to, uh, plan to uh, teach the AI uh, the same things people know. Uh, because without, if they are going to have the same knowledge, and I mean like uh, not just some scientific and technical things, but also also uh, social behavior, you will not be able to speak and communicate with the AI. So uh, the, we see it that way that uh, when the AI will be quite advanced, you will start interacting with it and learning it the same values and knowledge that we have. And basically, because the AI will be using universal brain, it's just absorbing absorbing patterns and understanding all those patterns. Uh, you also understand the patterns, our behavior, our motivations, and uh, if the reward punishment uh, system will be set correctly, uh, it will try to do things that we consider are good. And, uh, but there is not 100% like a guarantee for not making mistakes, that's just impossible. It's just like we can reduce the chances to a, to a minimum by tests and, and so on. But it's same with people that you cannot know uh, if somebody will do this or that. Uh, you still have just some chance, but you cannot know for sure. So, so it will be similar with AI. Um, I would like to ask one final question, and that is uh, concerned with uh, ethics. Um, and uh, all my, my main concern is that uh, I don't think uh, human level AI intelligence is going to come uh, around really soon, but uh, what I think that is more likely is to design systems that will be able to learn uh, from the data that, is, uh, that they can process. And uh, so you are building a system like this, basically, and you will put it as a product publicly available to anyone who can download this and use it. Uh, one, one of my main concern that is really uh, like my nightmare vision of the world, <laughs> almost, is that someone will take this kind of software and use it for, um, for uh, analysis of software that is available today. 
so that they could uh, use it for cybernetics attacks, for example. Uh, so how, how do you do it? How do you deal with uh, ethical issues? Uh, well, uh, it's a tool, uh, AI is a tool, and any tool can be used for good things, good, uh, good things and bad things. And uh, uh, the, like the, for example, computer security is never ending uh, fight between attacks and uh, the counter attacks. And basically, this applies also to military stuff like that, like from the entire history. And uh, so we think that if there are people who will use AI or machine learning for computer attacks, then there will be also people who will use the same technologies to counter them. And uh, it will never end. That's, the, that's what I know for sure. But uh, it's like usually there is more people who have good uh, intentions. And so uh, and they cooperate, and there is more of them, so they have advantage. Uh, before these uh, people who just want to do some of this. Of course, it's not 100%, and like nothing in life is 100%, but uh, at least in something. And uh, ethics in, uh, in our uh, research, uh, I can say this only for myself, but I think that what anybody would do is that uh, the creator of AI would try to imprint his own view of ethics to the, to the, to the AI channel. And uh, so if the like, good people who create AI, then it will be good. If bad people create AI, then the AI will be bad. But uh, I may be optimist, but I think that the bad people just, they will not create AI because they are focusing not on the creation of value, but just like capturing or stealing some other values. So they will not be the people who will be the lucky one create the, the AI that can actually be generated.
university in some stuff like this. We also were thinking about cooperating on some European project, but for us it's a little bit complicated because there are more bureaucracy that we want. <laughs> And uh, by the way, this openness is also the reason why we are uh, uh, making this platform to allow other either companies or teams to join us. Because the idea is basically that uh, we will have some we have some image recognition, some focus uh, modules. But if somebody has or is able to develop a better uh, modules and just add it to the marketplace, it can help us because it will just be more precise. And or faster, I think, and uh, but it will also help other people around. So uh, that's the idea. And basically, this is also the idea where we are not focusing that much on like enhancing this image recognition or some other modules because we know that uh, if we do the ecosystem right, then there will be really, uh, really soon somebody who will upload something that's two times better than what we did. And like we save time and it's good. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, one more thing, do you know about anyone else doing the similar thing as you are doing? Yes, of course. Uh, it's uh, like uh, probably everybody noticed that uh, last year uh, really exploded you know, the entire interest in AI, machine learning and stuff like that. And uh, uh, we think that uh, even Google, even though it doesn't appear like they are working on general AI, Sometimes it looks like they're just making better search or some better audio recognition and stuff like that. But uh, we believe that they are also working in general AI because I mean, they are smart, so they know what the potential. So why would they, you know, working on AI? And also, one kind of entity which is by Professor Alia Smith, which is designing the Mendo system, as mentioned. Uh, so rather they are doing something similar, but they are more focused on biology because of the models, so they are like more low level than we are. For it sometimes intersects, but uh, also know about this. Yeah. And also, maybe from the higher level, there is a team which is able to uh, around the Super Mario game and the Mario itself can behave quite wisely in the environment and even can communicate with the outer world and the researchers on the language base. So we are aware of that. Okay. And also we can mention Lampa organization but let's see this is a company which is doing something in sequence and predictions of sequences. So this is also a company which we are aware of and we have tested their algorithms as well. Okay, thank you. Hello, I have a more philosophical question. Uh, when or if the technological singularity happens, uh, when the AI is able to replicate so itself and create a more intelligent version of itself, what do you think is the solution um, so that the human race uh, stays relevant and won't get completely overwhelmed uh, by this uh, exponential growth of intelligence? I hear different views on it in our people. Some of us believe that it will happen, and some of us do not believe in it in like the near future. And I think uh, that uh, the solution, if it happens, is that like human will be able uh, to like store their mind in this artificial uh, environment. So it's sort of like extension of body and stuff, uh, uh, similar like this. But it's on a, on a level of, of mind and the body will not be so important. My, my view on this is that, uh, I mean, I not believe in uh, singularity. I'm actually trying to create singularity with, uh, with the team. But <laughs> that's a crazy part of the, of the answer. But the thing is that uh, 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 whoever creates this advanced AI uh, will not just create AI and then uh, stay there and just die. But uh, he will be probably smart and uh, so he will probably try to integrate himself with the AI or maybe upgrade himself with the AI. So actually,
actually it will not be like uh, there are people, there are robots, and the robots will start uh, uh, growing and growing and growing, and people will stay like this. It's probably that people will also start upgrading themselves and together. Because uh, just like we need to look at this from the selfish point of view, and there is no reason to create robots who are billion times better than we are and than just leave, and we will stay here, you know. Like, Try to be uh, like merged with uh, AI. Thank you. Uh, I have a question with more of a practical concern, and that's uh, how computationally expensive was playing at home. I mean, was it okay to play on your laptop, or did you need a server with a couple of high end GPUs? Uh, yes, you can play it on the laptop, and you can show it. Okay. In general, the fact is. <laughs> but uh, here I will point out that uh, currently we don't really focus much more on optimization. So many of these models are really not optimized, and uh, because we are uh, trying to implement some model, test it, you know, see if it works, if it does things we need it to work. But uh, the optimization phase is really in the future. And here it's really useful that we are using CUDA because CUDA is much more faster than CPU and uh, so we can uh, we can live with some ineffectivity. Yeah, so right now it's playing Pong on the laptop. There is a CUDA card and uh, it's like 11 frames or the simulation step per second right now. And the most uh, performance demanding thing is the neural network inside and the network has around uh, 2,000 neurons in the first layer and uh, 1,000 neurons in the output layer. Yes, and this network is pre-trained and it... Yeah, yeah it's so pre-trained. Like uh, 20,000 steps to train in this... You know, 20 or 30,000 steps, simulation steps to train. Yes. So there is some time where the network actually grasp uh, the goal states and then tries to learn these states. And how many minutes was this 20, 30,000 steps? So, of course, uh, depends on how the machine is it's fast. It's like 20 minutes. Is like the difficult computer is just like about 10 minutes. 10 minutes yeah. of training. But it's, it's just low, low, low cost card. Maybe cards will be doing something bigger, some bigger better. It's in, in like minutes. Uh, I have a follow-up question on the ethics that I was boring, by the way. Uh, I will ask, like, on the other side, uh, in your wildest dreams, like, where do you see your AI? Like, you have, you have shown us the neat six like creature, like, any plans for making fluffy household pets, for example? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we want to focus only on the brain part of the, of the AI. And uh, this is why we are opening this platform and uh, so other companies that maybe want to create some little dogs or uh, self driving cars or anything like that, uh, they will make their own implementation using our AI brain. And uh, so just imagine that uh, you're a, a car company and uh, uh, you know that our AI works, which it doesn't, like this at, at this moment, but in a curious it will. And uh, so you know that uh, it can do this uh, intelligent thing and uh, you integrate it in your car, you know, integrate it in the sensor of the car, uh, integrate it to the like, actuators of the car, I mean like wheel and uh, gas, pedal and these things. And uh, then the AI uh, and also use some reward and punishment, which can be a little bit complex in this situation. And then the car will learn how to drive or how to actually get the, uh, get the reward. And uh, so the, like, our idea is that we really want to focus on you know, this universal brain and let other institution companies to decide where they will use it. Okay, so more like the bottom dynamic soldier with the reward and financial instinct? Uh, if they will decide to use it in uh, the robot, then they can. Okay, now, and one more question, Sherman. Like You mentioned the car driving itself. Isn't like the more rigid algorithms more suitable for for these cars than like thinking AI? 
that might be, but uh, this is also <laughs> a question of the, with this uh, threshold that I was mentioning, that maybe you can solve a uh, self-driving car by machine learning and really statistical uh, uh, approaches and solutions, uh, or maybe not, you know, like you really need to test it, because if you see the results that uh, uh, Google self-driving car has right now, there are still some uh, many situation that the uh, car cannot uh, handle. You know, like for example, if there are uh, uh, holes in the road, the car will just drive through the, the holes. Or if there is, I think, like bad weather, the car will not be able to drive correctly, and so on. So it has its limits. And uh, uh, of course, our approach uh, will have its limits. But uh, if uh, as it will go more and more universal and able to process <coughs> much more complex patterns of like situation. Then uh, it should have advantage over uh, like simple models that don't. It's basically like this: that uh, if you compare yourself uh, with a dog, for example, the dog sees the same world as you see, but because he has also eyes and he's in the same environment, and everything. But the dog doesn't see the patterns in the world that you see. The dog doesn't see that this is car and the car has this price and is this brand. And all these things the dog doesn't see, even though it's in there. And it's only because the dog doesn't have the system to recognize all these patterns and some hierarchies and so on. And uh, so what we think is that if our AI will be universal and advanced enough, it will be able to find all these patterns and then act, you know, best in the interest of who is in the world. What is your strategy or I guess your vision for making uh, intellectual property in terms of, uh, let's say, keeping ownership of certain AI patterns, as opposed to, let's say, something that somebody else might develop and copyright it for themselves because the process is different. Well, obviously we cannot uh, do uh, like copyright thefts or patent infringements, so uh, we'll need to be careful in this. And uh, as I know, uh, what we develop is ours, and what we are is like third party things usually uh, copyright, or, you know, like there's license that allows it. And uh, if, uh, that, like, maybe the other side, how you can uh, do this is that if somebody will try to steal our uh, AI produce algorithms, ideas, then I guess uh, maybe there is not much we can do about this. But it's uh, similar about how uh, we treat this with our games. Because we know that there are people who are violent our games, but we don't care. So it's like we really don't want to force anybody to do like if they don't want to pay then just don't pay them easy. Yeah, well I mean the reason why I ask is one of the ways you said that you would commercialize your AI would be through licensing. But if all you can have is let's say an underlining software where you have other companies, let's say, um, create the processes for those particular applications, if that's your only plan, let's say revenue streams, official licenses for let's say sanctioned applications. I mean, is that kind of the way forward you see in terms of this being a profitable business? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, we think that uh, the best modules for this market will be uh, ours, or the most important will be ours. And uh, if not, uh, if there will be still some better uh, third party modules, then we will uh, license them. Uh, so the idea is that uh, somebody or some company will uh, give a module to our platform. And this module will get used in some car or anything. Uh, the company who created uh, the module will get some share of the revenue that we receive. That's the idea. We don't know, uh, right now, we don't know how to like, split it you know, or like, how to deal with like If there are, for example, five different companies working on uh, or having their AI modules in one brain or one end product, how to deal with uh, royalties in this situation. But, uh, uh, your soul is in the future. Okay, I have a technical remark. We are maybe out of time, so I would suggest to make a five minute break for those who want to leave and then we can continue the discussion if it's okay. Or we should end. Yeah, we should end in 10 minutes. Okay, so we have uh, the last 10 minutes, so we will help. Good evening. I would like to ask a question. How much is actually the algorithm hard coding for a particular task which is performed to illustrate my point? 
For example, if I would like your current algorithm without modifications and I would rotate it in 90 degrees, would that be still able to play? Well, with no problem. This is really no problem and we well, it's not tested because we started with uh, the whole experiment and came not really back in the, future, in the past, but uh, I still believe that the same, exactly the same model will be able to play games like River Drive, for example, or maybe even Space Invaders. Would it need additional time for learning? Or would it be able to even the same learned patterns for the game which is just a routine? You mean if uh, the game is rotated, if uh, there will be additional learning? Yeah, I was, I was talking about the model, not the instance of the model. Of course, the model have to find that something is changed. So additional learning will be needed. Yeah, you know my point is that if you would, if you would present this task to human, he would be able to use the same yeah, knowledge. That's, that's correct, but the human has a concept of, of uh, getting an idea of, or having an idea that something is rotated in different way than it was before. And I'm pretty sure that this model don't have it just because it wasn't learned for them. Mm -hmm. You were uh, learned that uh, these things are actually the same things only rotated. Which is quite high level knowledge. I see. All right. It's also related to, to some like internal representation of the world, which is built there somehow. It's learned, and uh, at the moment it's not flexible enough to, to use the same uh, internal representation for the game. But we are trying to do it as general that it would be possible in future in this way that you just rotate it and the system understands it. All right, thank you for your answer. One more thing, it's an ethical question. Uh, let's say people succeed in this task, and at some point we will have the intelligence which is equal to human or even better than human. And we as humans, we rule the other creatures because we are more intelligent. And my question is whether do you think it's a good strategy from evolution point of view to develop something which is more intelligent than you? <coughs> Actually, I think it's the best strategy because you cannot be sure that uh, there is not somebody else working on it, maybe with bad uh, intentions, or maybe there, there are not some AI aliens just flying to our planet. <laughs> and uh, so I think it's the best strategy, and uh, it's actually a better shot at our future because uh, if we uh, don't do AI or if we don't advance in technology, then almost everybody who sits in this room will be dead in 50 or 100 years because we will just be old. And uh, with AI, we have at least we have a chance, little chance, but we have a chance to basically live forever. And uh, so, just from pure like, strategy point of view, I think it's a good strategy. Just we just need to be on the creators of AI need to be careful to not get killed by AI in a way that actually happens. One, one last question, because I know we're running out of time. So, do you think it's possible, in principle, to control something which is much more intelligent than you? I'm, I'm saying, like, not somebody is 130 IQ, somebody else is 160, but we are talking about, let's say, 1 billion IQ. Do you think, in, in principle, it's possible to control such a thing? I don't think it's possible, but as we said before, we are like, making a way that it will extend our probability. So we will be sort of part of it. It's not, not the case that there will be, it will be completely disconnected from our way of thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, critical part of the artificial intelligence is machine learning. So Planning itself it involves a lot of optimization. I haven't seen many optimization approaches around your architecture. Uh, do you plan to uh, investigate it and focus more on uh, experimenting or inventing uh, new ways how to optimize, for example, <coughs> parameters of neural networks? Or are you just planning to uh, use some existing algorithms and focus on architecture? I'm not really sure if we are strong enough 
right now to develop something which will be way better in optimization task than uh, optimizers, which is already there. So right now, I think we're not really planning to develop some better optimization algorithms. It, it may change if, if uh, we found that if we find that uh, it is uh, it is not usable or there's not nothing usable for us. But I think this isn't really probable in the near future. <laughs> I am curious whether do you have some master plan how to develop your system? I mean, you presented here uh, there is some system that is able to play pong. The next level is going to be game again. I mean, Tetris, and there will be need for speed and then counter strike. Yeah. So this is like a game with development. But in India, one question is whether the system at the end will be play will be able to play your counter strike as good as the pong at the beginning together. I mean, all the games together. But this is not my question. I mean, would you like to stick to the like engineer point of view? That means that, uh, that the architecture of the system is like plus, like task based, or you will stick to a let's say bio inspired or a, like a human based principle? I mean, you will create a model that are in the human brain. That means mimic the human brain and create some complex and sophisticated architecture at the beginning and then test it on the task. I think we are doing both. Okay. We are trying to inspire from biology as well uh, from engineering. So we are doing like a mixture of this. Uh, the game uh, exercise, I would say, call it, is because it's like simple to test. It's not our aim to play all the games which are there, but we are more, as I said, we are trying to test, uh, for example, working memory and pattern recognition and stuff like this, which are much more sophisticated that is needed for playing artificial games, and we are uh, inspired from biological systems. And so, in this task, maybe it's time for the last question. So, my question is, uh, the AI is pretty good at our technology, uh, generally is pretty good at replacing jobs. Uh, what do you think is the solution when like 30% or I don't know how many percent, but a lot of people are employed in transportation and selling items. So, what should we do when these jobs simply disappear to the AI and the uh, large section of the population becomes unemployed because these jobs are simply disappear. Well, uh, I think as uh, right now we are seeing that the jobs are disappearing uh, because of the AI uh, evolving pretty fast. I think in the same way there will be new job opportunities for human. Maybe it will require different skills but still, I think it is really, or we are not capable to really see what will happen. And uh, I personally don't believe that uh, people will, like, uh, don't have uh, enough work to do in the future. So plus, plus one. Good evening, thank you for your talk. Uh, may I ask you what's the 